5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Blast off for the fantastic Space Age Shock Show, The Wizard of Mars, starring John Carradine. The Wizard of Mars. Never before in the history of motion picture technology has there been anything like the frightening new dimension of ultra depth. It's not 3D, it's new. The most thrilling movie experience of all time. The Wizard of Mars dares you to remain seated as gigantic fireballs crash out of the screen and explode over your head. The Wizard of Mars double dares you to remain in the theater as a Martian electrical storm crashes into the audience. The Wizard of Mars triple dares you to retain control of your mind as telepathic creatures attack your brain, crash diving into a thundering time storm to experience the most incredible screen journey ever taken. A beautiful girl and three desperate men against the fury of Mars. The alien beauty of the Martian landscape and the glistening subterranean Martian canals as you ride the rapids into the fiery depths of the Martian underworld. Journey through the Valley of Fire at the center of the Red Planet. Enter, if you dare, the haunted Martian city of the dead. Beware of the ghost-like creatures who refuse to die. Encounter the Colossus of the Universe, the mighty Wizard of Mars, conqueror of a thousand worlds, master of the stars. Witness a battle with a gigantic spike pendulum of death at the center of time. See the Holocaust as two great universal forces destroy the mighty Martian time dome. Don't miss The Wizard of Mars, starring John Carradine as the wizard, with this great cast at a specially equipped theater or drive-in in Ultra Death, color by Deluxe. Yes, yes indeed. You know what? I, I, I really love John Carradine. I mean, the man has that wonderful, melodious, baritone voice. He was just a great actor. But as I said in a uh, review I did last year in the TMOA uh, reunion show, he admits that he's been in some of the greatest movies Hollywood has ever made and a whole lot of garbage. Well, guess which category this one fits in? <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, the garbage. I feel sorry for him because originally the opening credits read John Carradine as the Wizard of Mars. Yeah, really nice. Then they re-released the movie and changed the title, and the opening credits read John Carradine as Horrors of the Red Planet. Oh, poor guy. Well, as you can probably figure out, this is a science fiction retelling of the classic children's story of the Wizard of Oz. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't have any of the charm or the class of the uh, MGM movie. It doesn't even have any songs. But I can fix that. <laughs> I bet you Somewhere can. in a big rocket in deep space astronauts are a traveling to an exciting place. Yes, the story starts with four astronauts aboard their rocket ship flying towards Mars. There's the very intelligent doctor. There's the kind and uh, compassionate captain. 
There's the very nervous and slightly cowardly navigator. And there's Dorothy. Don't ask me what Dorothy does on the ship, because anything she does, someone else is doing at the same time. So, I mean, she doesn't even get to interpret the computer. So, but uh, anyway, they're flying towards Mars when all of a sudden they're struck by some freak outer space lightning. Don't you just hate when that happens? <laughs> Their front capsule becomes separated from the rest of the ship, and both pieces fall and land on the surface of Mars. Well, they've only got enough oxygen for about 90 hours, but they figure out if they leave their, their visor open just a crack, then they'll be able to survive a bit longer using the thin air on Mars. So they go out, they're landed by a canal, so they inflate the life rafts and start sailing down the canal. They end up in a cave that takes them underground near the core of the planet. There's molten lava everywhere. have to get out of there because it's going to explode like a volcano and all this while the navigator has this little beeping thingy that's supposed to be leading them to the rest of their spaceship so they can call for help well as they're about to run out of air they finally reach where the beeping is coming from and discover it's an old space probe that was sent years before. No. What we had thought to be the main stage has turned out to be a time-corroded relic from an earlier chapter of the exploration of Mars. Just enough power left in its batteries to transmit a useless signal. don't you see? The Mars Scout. We sent it here two years ago to see if man could live on Mars. An unmanned biological laboratory to tell us whether or not we could survive the elements. That's what's so funny. But, hooray! The, the fuel tanks still have about one quarter of a container of liquid oxygen so they can recharge their oxygen tanks. Obviously, the people who made this movie never read a science book. The next morning, they wake up and they notice something glinting in the sun and they look at it's these golden tiles that make this kind of a road leading into the mountain. So they, they follow it, and it takes them to this enormous old castle on the top of the mountain under a red dome. And they walk happily towards it, having found civilization at last. They're out of the boats, they're out of the caves, they're out of the sand. They're going to Martian Disneyland. Well, the inside of the castle is like a maze, and the only sign that there's ever been any life is a door that is partially uh, 
cut through by this hand uh, blowtorch that one of them finds, and the black dust outlines of a couple of figures. Is that going to happen to us? So they're wandering around in this maze, and there's all these bevels in the wall, and they eventually realize that they're not bevels, but life support tubes. And they clean one off, and there is a Martian. Whatever it is, I'm glad it's dead. We've passed thousands of these containers. There must be an entire civilization entombed here. Beings that were capable of developing an intelligence far beyond their own cranial capacity. Judging from the artificial encasement of the brain, they must have undergone thousands of years of mental evolution in one lifetime. It's almost unbelievable. A race such as theirs. And as they look at it, by the way, the Martian was actually pretty cool. He was like, like glowing incandescent. He, they speak in, in telepathic whispers, so they have these really big Ferengi-like ears. And uh, he, he sends them the telepathic message to tell them what to do. I represent... The people of Mars, the people of Mars, the people of Mars, and in the name of the people of Mars, we want you to go in the spooky room. <laughs> At the end of the hallway is this room. It's completely dark. Entrance covered in cobwebs. They're frightened to death. Well, they have good reason to be frightened, because when they go inside, they see the enormous projected head of John Carradine. We know you want to communicate with us, but your language is foreign to us. I only understand a part of what you say. An evolution. What evolution? What manner of life are you? I see perplexity among you. As long as your minds are clouded with questions about our nature, we cannot determine your purpose upon our world. <laughs> Who then proceeds to explain to them what's been happening and what they can do to get back to their spaceship. Well, I'm not one for spoiling endings, so I won't. Oh, yes, I will. <laughs> it seems that what happened is, it seems that what happened is, uh, the Martians, in order to defend themselves from invaders, created a machine that stopped time. Well, that's great because it kept them from being invading, but the problem is, when you make a machine that stops time, nobody can turn it off <laughs> because time has stopped and they're all frozen. <laughs> And so it's up to our intrepid heroes to go to the time machine and fix it and start time running again. Everything starts to explode, and they wake up aboard their spaceship. Only two minutes has passed, but they all have a three or four day growth of stubble on their faces. Two minutes.
on unraveling the last mystery of the universe. This we learn. We learn. As without birth, there can be no life. So without death, life itself is meaningless. For without death, life cannot begin again. Well, except, of course, for Dorothy. There. I just saved you wasting 75 minutes of your life. Well, okay, so I wasted 10 minutes of that, so you, I saved you wasting 65 minutes of your life. Uh, John Carradine, of course, as always, was wonderful in his part, and like I said, for the year it was made, which, as I recall, was 1965, it actually did have some fairly halfway decent special effects.